All right, let's go into the sermon. So um, I'm not going to rehash. I know you can see the slides down there. I'm not rehashing part one of my videos, right? So part, if you've already watched part one of the videos, I already talk about um, you know, the three different positions. But uh, I wanted to preach, this is going to, going to be my last sermon on the Trinity for a while. So I preached the, uh, these three are one. And if you remember going through those different positions, you know, there was the, the different walls. Today, I want to just share with you uh, some of the things that I um, have sort of learned and, and I've come across as well that I thought would be interesting for you guys on this topic. Just from a lot of the discussions I've had and the, and the extra study that I've done uh, on this topic. Uh, so I'm going to now discuss the other side, right? So the other, the other wall, so we already talked about the one person wall, which was my These Three Are One sermon, talked about why Jesus was the Father, why there is this blending. Um, now I'm going to talk uh, about why there are three, the three persons. And I, I actually do like that word now, so I think persons is the right word. Um, that there are three persons and one person uh, and like i said i'm not going to rehash really what i talked about in that um that video but just give you a little bit extra on top of that so why is there why is there confusion i know you may have already got this from the video that i created in part one that there's this confusion within this trinity spectrum right there's all these phrases that are being coined now right now there's this trinity spectrum because of farsi and uh, and now i can see people commenting saying hey let's just keep the main thing the main thing right <laughs> which is which is good that came from you know um, that that video that last video i made so you already know that there are these four walls, right? The two common walls and there are the three positions. And this is why there's this confusion, right? There's this confusion because when you preach, when somebody starts making points about the one person common wall, you have people that are in position one saying, ah, you're in position three, right? Um, and then when you preach or you talk about the three persons, uh, you have the position three people thinking that you're in position one when there are actually three different positions, right? And there may be more than this, obviously. This is just the three positions that are being represented by the controversy that's going on. So uh, my these three are one sermon. I was talking about one person, but today there are three. I'm talking about the other wall, just so we're, we're clear about that. Now, um, oh, let me just uh, get my notes out, actually not everything is in here. So just before I get on into uh, diving into this, I want to just cover a few um, definitions, right? And, and, and these obviously are not, uh, you know, what's the word, like just authoritative, because I'm, I'm just getting these definitions, like you know how you can just type into Google and just go define modalism. And then in Google, it just comes up with this result, and it just tells you exactly what modalism it is. So if you type modalism into Google, right, and you just say define modalism, this is what you'll read. It says, um, the doctrine that the persons of the Trinity re represent only three modes or aspects of the divine revelation, not distinct, so they're not separate, not distinct and coexisting parts of the divine nature. Now, by that definition, right, which is how m many people understand modalism, right? They understand modalism that there are not three coexisting, co-eternal persons within the Godhead, that there is just this one God that is just wearing multiple hats throughout time, not at the same time, and then the three persons are not eternal because there was only one person that was eternal that then revealed himself in different ways, right, throughout time, right? But, see, in this Trinity spectrum right nobody actually believes this right that's why i believe that all these three positions are on here because none of these three positions are actually modalism now the reason why when you listen to pastor jimenez's sermon on the trinity spectrum you you need to understand that the reason why he doesn't add position three onto his spectrum is because of his definition and this is what i've found in this whole trinity controversy it's all about definitions and this is what people as far as i can understand are disagreeing over because if you if you listen to his sermon you'll, you'll hear he makes the point that as long as you believe three persons three individuals three entities you're in my camp and it's by the definition of persons that the four men don't like using that word right and that's why i think he's making this clear distinction and that's why position three is not on his spectrum and they re realize they're not on his spectrum because of his definition of how he defines his spectrum but um 
but and I'll get I'll get into a bit more. They, but they do, but they don't believe modalism, right? They don't believe that they you know they do believe the three components are co-eternal, co-existing, and that's sort of what I went about in in part one of my videos. So that is the Google definition. Obviously, it's not authoritative. So I'm not trying to say get my doctrine and my uh, my definitions from Google. But the word modalism obviously is not in the Bible. So um, you'll you'll find that that's what the teaching of modalism. Teachers and modalism and oneness supposedly are synonymous words. Like they're kind of just known as each other. And that's why in my last sermon, these three, I talked about the labels and the danger of them. Because you need to understand what people actually believe under the labels that they're actually using. And we find that, you know, like uh, when I talked to that preacher I told you guys about, where Baptist is really kind of losing its meaning as well. Because it means different things to different people. Now, what about the definition of person? Because I remember I talk, told you guys that the four men, they kind of, they kind of uh, people are kind of defining person as like this different consciousness, different center of will, center of consciousness and whatnot. And I said that, you know, there really isn't this definition in the dictionary anywhere because when you Google the definition of person, you really get three categories of definitions and they're the ones that we're really familiar with, right? Like the first one was, it's just a human being, right, regarded as an individual. Because when we talk about person, generally we're talking, you know, we're, we're differentiating it from an animal, right? And, it's an, and the way I understand it, it's like it's an identity, right? It's somebody, it's a person. But obviously there are other uh, ways, you know, in legal or formal context, an unspecified individual, um, an individual characterized by a preference or liking for a specified thing. And I remember the example was like you're a cat person or you're a dog person. Look at this one. This one says, a character in a play or a story. So even by like d the dictionary definition, you know, like they're saying like, oh, God's just not this person in a play that's wearing these different, you know, things. But then person can mean that from its, from its definition, right? So, and another thing is it says an individual's body, you know, like having drugs on your person. This is probably the one that Ashton's really familiar with, right, that, that definition. So um, the second one here, and see, this is how I understand person and why I'm comfortable using the word person when talking about the Trinity, is the second definition, if you type it into Google, it says a category used in the classification of pronouns, right? It's pronouns are like he, his, I, I think. I'm not, I'm not a grammar expert, but. Um, and it says pos possessive determiners. Right, and verb forms according to whether they indicate the speaker first person, the addressee second person, or a third party third person. So that's sort of where I come from, where I think, yeah, I, I actually don't have a problem with the word person because it's like an identity. You know, like I talk about, like, you know, you speak in the third person, the second person. I mean, you're, you're identifying different people um, when you speak in the first person and the third person and whatnot. Now, this is what's funny, right? And I don't know if you guys have typed into Google and actually looked up these definitions, but then you'll get to the third definition, right? Which is Christian theology, right? And look at what it says. Each of the three modes of being of God, namely the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, who together constitute the Trinity. So it's kind of like Google. Google doesn't even know what the right word to use is, right? Is it person or modes? Because, you know, you look up the word person and it says it's the three modes of being of God. Anyway, so I just think that's funny, right? So let's get, let's get into a couple of the uh, verses. So um, I, I, I think when I hear the word person, I don't think center of consciousness, center of will. I think we think that because when we think of person, we think of a human being. And a human being is a center of will, center of consciousness and whatnot. But God's nature, when we're describing God's nature, obviously God is not a not a man. The Godhead is not a human being, right? So it's a, it can work differently. Um, so then when I think of person, I think of that second definition, like first person, third person. There's like different identities, and that's why there's, there are separate identities within the Godhead, and that's why it's with and thee and us and whatnot, because it's, it's a, it's, there are different people there in a sense. Um, let me go over a couple of the weaker arguments for position three. So if you remember position three was one person, three components, right? So it's not, God cannot be identified um, separately within the Godhead. He only has one identity, right? That's their position. God has one identity and that's why he's one person. But the moment you say three persons is wrong because God does not have three identities. Um, 
And I'm not going to go over all the arguments. I just think this one is a weak argument. But it's pretty much they're looking up where God is referred to as a singular person, right? And they'll say that God is only mentioned as singular person. He's never referred to as persons, plural, like when we say the Godhead is three persons. Um, now, there's one in Job. He says, will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you accept his person? Will you contend for God? Right? So that's one in Job. Um, I'll show you another one and then I'll explain why I think it's, it's, it's a pretty weak argument. But Hebrews 1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So talking about Jesus Christ being the image of, of God, the express image, meaning the outward image, as opposed to an impress image, right? If you think about when you have an impression of somebody, it's something you think inwardly, but when you express, you have an expression, you're actually outwardly, you know, manifesting your words, right? So Jesus is the express image of his person, because it's something that you can actually see. And they say here, see, it's his person, God is only described as one person. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, the reason why I think this is a really weak argument is because oftentimes the word God in the Bible is used to refer to the Father, right? So the reason why I think these arguments are weak is because they work for both sides. That's what I think of when I think of a weaker argument. It's like a verse that it can rationally, logically be explained by both positions. It doesn't take away from either position. And therefore, it's not really something that a position has on another position. I was speaking to a guy out today. I, I mentioned his name, right, when we were praying. Um, and he believed, you know, he, he was studying, uh, I don't know if he was a physicist or if he was studying to be a physicist. And he talked about like, you know, well, the reason why he, he, he thinks evolution could be true, because it's statistically possible. And I'm like, well, yeah, maybe it's statistically possible, but does that mean it's probable, right? You know, just because there is the slight chance that it could be, uh, that doesn't mean you're being reasonable when it's a one in however million, billion, zillion chance, right, of it happening. Um, because I kind of like to use the, the leaf example. Sometimes when I'm out soul winning, I'll tell people like, you know, leaves fall down from the trees and they fall onto the ground in a random pattern. But if you came home and there were just like these leaves just like lined up in a perfect line, you wouldn't look at that and just think, oh, wow, what a coincidence. That, that they're all lined up like that. Like your first thought would be, who did that? You know, are my kids mucking around? Like are they playing with the leaves or something? You, you see a pattern, right? And you're like, it didn't just randomly fall down from the trees. So basically what he's saying, well, it's possible that they could just line up like that, you know, after millions and billions of years, but it's like, yeah, but you're not being reasonable anymore, right? So, I, and I was saying to him like, well, you know, if you're just going on probability, I, I said, it's just as probable that somebody created it. So. I just said to him, like, well, so you don't even really have an argument because for creation, you can say it's probable that God did it too. So then what have you got that's on the other position? Uh, so the point I'm making is like, you know, when you don't really have something that gives you the edge over the other position, then it's not really an argument because then both can explain that, right? So that's why when I sort of preach the Bible to you guys and I sort of like hit on some verses on positions, I go to the ones, you know, I have my verses that kind of like support it, but have other explanations. But then there are ones where it's like, I know the other position can't explain this. And that's why I sort of hammer those ones. So I, I, this is why I think this is a weak argument, because you can easily prove from the Bible that, that the word God can just be refer to the, referring to the Father. An interesting one about John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, right? People will say like, well, well the Word was with the Father. But if God in that part of the sentence is the Father, the next part of the sentence is the Word was God which says the word was the father. So either, either you're going to do some mental gymnastics on this verse and then say, well, in God, it's referring to the father. And then in the second part of the verse, it's referring to the Trinity, right? The word was God within the Trinity. Or you're going to say the word was with the Trinity. But then it's like, how is the word with the Trinity when he is the Trinity, he is part of the Trinity? And then you know, and then, yeah, then, then you make the second part of the sentence make sense. The word uh, was the Trinity. But then it's like, it's like you can't take both unless you accept both. Does that make sense? It's kind of like if the word was with the Father, then the verse is saying the word was the Father. But if the word was the Trinity, then it doesn't make sense that the word was with the Trinity because the word is the Trinity, right? 
So it's just one of those things where this is, this is a verse I think is pretty clear that it's talking about you know, God, but I'll show you some other ones, right, where we can see that it doesn't take away from the fact that God could be a single person when it's talking about the Father and Jesus is the express image of that singular person, the Father, not necessarily talking about the entire Godhead. Um, let's look at Colossians 1. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Right? So we're already referencing the Father. We reference the Son. And then it says here, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. So we do see here that Jesus, he is the express image of God, right? He's the image of the invisible God. No question about that. But then we see here in John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. So it's almost used in, you know, interchangeably there. He hath declared him, right? So he's, is he declaring God, which is something different from the Father, or is he declaring the Father? He's in the bosom of the Father. He's the image of uh, God. He's the express image of God. He's the, in, he's the image of the invisible God. He's declared him. Is it God or the Father? But then we see John 14, where Jesus saith in him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And I'm just underlying this passage here. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. So even before we get on to verse 8, 9, Jesus is saying here in verse 7, If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And he says, From henceforth ye know him, the Father, and ye have seen him, the Father. Isn't that interesting, right? Jesus is not just saying, you're seeing an image of the Father. He's telling his disciples, no, you have actually known the Father, and you have actually seen the the Father. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So you see here, you could easily argue that Jesus is the image of the Father, right? Because if you see him, you see the Father, and that's why he's the image of the invisible God, the express image of his person. You could easily argue that that God is the Father, and that's why it's singular person. It doesn't take away from the three persons. But you know, even my position, three person and one person, it's like I kind of accept both arguments, right? They both kind of fit. It um, doesn't really make a difference for my position, but I don't think it's verse. I don't think they are verses that only work for position one or position three. It's like they could work for both. Um, uh, it says here, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. I just wanted to go to this verse in 1 Timothy 6 because I think this is another verse that could swing both ways as well in the sense of is it saying that Jesus can't be seen or is it just saying the Father can't be seen? I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, which in his times he shall show, right? So referring, I believe, to Jesus Christ, saying he will show something. And what is he going to show? Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting Amen. So I do think this is a verse that could swing both ways, right? Because this was, this was basically Tyler Baker's big verse where he's saying, well, how come Jesus can't be seen? And I get how he's, how he's interpreting it that way, basically referring that the who is the blessed and only potentate, king of kings and lord of laws. And that is something that is referring to Jesus Christ. And then it goes on that he's dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So I know Pastor Anderson's interpretation, I think, was that the light is what no man, or something like that, uh, dwelling, something, something about the light, I, I thought his position was, no man hath seen nor can see. I believe it's just a reference to the fact that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, right? He's the image of the Father. He's the express image of his person. And I think this is kind of just saying the same thing. That's what I think the correct interpretation is. But I can see how it can be taken the other way, where it says, which in his times he shall show, and then it goes on to talk about the invisible God, which is the Father, right? Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, 
who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So I do think it's talking about the Father because I do believe that Adam and Eve saw the Word, right? The Word has always been the way God has interacted with the physical world, as we learned about as well in Kevin's sermons on the threefold nature of God. Um, and um, I can't remember exactly what sermon he preached, but I remember he, he talked about what the Word was and it's how God interacts with the world. And this is why the word it was walking in the garden. The voice of the Lord was working in the garden. I believe that's what people saw when they met Jesus Christ. You know, so there was this bodily form. So people had seen the word before the word was manifest in the flesh. So that's why I think where it talks about the invisible God, it's talking about the Father. But you know, these three are one. So it's just that's why it's always this confusion when you try and discuss the Trinity. Because it sounds like you're arguing for one position when you're not always, because you kind of believe both. Right. Um, now, here are some weaker arguments for position one, right? And these are a lot that you've heard throughout the sermons, people talking about all these different wills, because I think a lot of these passages don't necessarily take away from position three, where they explain that there can be a distinction between God the man and God the Godhead, right? Jesus became a man, but even as a man, he was 100% God. But there is a separation in person there, because there was the man Christ Jesus, right? There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So there is this distinction between Jesus Christ, the man, and the Word, right? And the Godhead, the Trinity. So a lot of these ones, and I'll breeze through these, but if you understand that there is this distinction between the humanity and the deity, you can see how these verses, yes, can it be used to support that there's a distinction within the Godhead? It can, but it can also be explained by a distinction between the humanity and the deity. And that's why it's not, they're not really arguments for either one, because both of them can explain why we see here a difference between Jesus Christ and the Father. Um, and when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, I just underlined that just because an interesting point. Because you know how we have a lot of uh, English sayings, right? And a lot of them come from the King James Bible. And if you think about the saying, oh, you're only a stone's throw away, you know, they might say, oh, he just lives a stone's throw away. You know, that comes from the King James Bible, this, you know, that he was away a stone's cast. He was just a little bit away. Um, and kneeling down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So the argument is, see, they have a different will. They're not the same person. Yeah, totally accept that, right? Totally accept that there's three persons. Um, but it's not an argument that they're not one person, right? Because this can be explained by the distinction between the humanity and the deity, right? It's a man on earth who has a will, who hungered, who thirsted, who had a different way, who was scared. Well, not scared, I don't know if scared, but obviously he was troubled by going to the cross, right? And he even said, if it be possible, right, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So his will was that the cup would pass from him, right? But, you know, he, he submitted to the will of the Father. Here's another one. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So somebody might say, well, if the Son is the Holy Ghost, right? Aren't you speaking against the Holy Ghost when you speak against the Son, right? If they're talking about the Godhead, right? But, you know, you could explain this verse by saying, no, well, it's saying if you speak against the man, you can be forgiven. But if you speak against the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, it won't be forgiven you. So again, we see a, a distinction here between the Son and the Holy Ghost, but it's a distinction that can still be explained by the deity and the humanity. I'm not saying I know exactly which one is the right. I'm just saying they fit both, right? I'm just showing you some examples and showing you, you know what, from both positions, position one and position three, and position two, position two kind of is mine, except both, right? That they can both be valid explanations. I'm saying that these are balanced, then they don't take away one from the other. Uh, here's another one where the Son does not have knowledge that the Father has, right? So it's kind of like, well, how can the Son not have this knowledge if the Son is the Father, right? If Jesus is the Father. Well, it can be explained by the humanity versus deity. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But if that day and that hour knoweth no man, 
right? Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So it easily could be argued that it's just a distinction between the man and God, not a distinction within the Godhead, right? Uh, here's another, right? This was a big one where, you know, the Son submits to the Father. There is a submission there of two different people. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And this is one of those passages, I don't know if you've read in 1 Corinthians 15, and you just, I just remember before I figured out what it was saying, I'm just like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, you know, just the way it's worded. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Then cometh the end, right? When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So there's a proof there that God can mean just Father, right? And, and that God can be one person and it could just be referring to Father. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. This is talking about, you know, Jesus Christ, right? He hath put all things under his feet. For when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, the Father, is accepted, which did put all things under him. So it's kind of like the father's putting all things under him, but the son is putting all things under him. But when the son says he puts all things under him, it's revealed, it's manifested that obviously it's not the father that's getting put under him because eventually he's going to hand up the kingdom to the father. That's what that passage is saying. It's saying it's manifest that he is accepted, the father, so he's accepted from being put under him, which did put all things under him. Because the father put all things under the son. Does that make sense? So the father put everything under the son. The son's putting everything under the son. But it's saying that when the Son puts everything under the Son, he's not putting the Father under the Son, right? And when all things shall be subdued unto him, uh, unto the Father, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's why this is one of those passages where you're like, what is going on in this passage? Because it's just like, who's putting things under what? I don't know anymore. But that's, that's what it's saying. It's saying that Father puts under the Son, Son puts under the Son, but it's manifested that the Father's not under the Son because eventually the Son will hand up to the Father, right? Oh yeah, and the point I was trying to make there is that distinction, right? That you can distinguish between the man and because the man is putting all things under him and the Father's putting everything under the man, but the man eventually hands it back to the Father, you know, after he's ruled and reigned with us for a thousand years, right? In the end, he eventually gives it up to the Father. So that can be explained by humanity deity. Revelation 5, another one. I and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So this is one you've probably been hearing about, right? And the lamb is the word, right? And there are two different people. He's sitting next to the person that's sitting on the throne, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Because remember, the argument was Jesus Christ was him that sat upon the throne. And I think that argument is valid, right? Because the three are one. But we also see here that there's a distinction between the lamb, because the lamb is not him that sitteth upon the throne, because the lamb is taking the book from him that sitteth, sitteth upon the throne. But the thing is, the lamb could easily be referring to the humanity of Jesus Christ, right? Because John himself the Baptist said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So it was the man Christ Jesus that was the Lamb of God, right? That taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Right? So easily you could say that Lamb in Revelation is the man, Christ Jesus. Um, Luke 1. Uh, I just sort of put these verses in here because I, I, I'm not 100% on this. I'm not going to be dogmatic about this. But my sort of position right now is when the Bible talks about the Son, the Son is referring to the, to the man. You know, that's kind of like what I believe right now. Um, but I'm not 100%. But I, but I, I think the Son is the man, right? That's why in 1 John 5, 7, when it says there are three that bear record in heaven, it's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But the Word became flesh, John 1, you know, and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? So the Word became flesh, and then when the Word became flesh, that's when it was now 
the Son of God. The Son of God was man. But that's why in Matthew 28, you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because the Son has now been revealed. The Son is the Word. So it's not wrong to refer to, as well, the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because it was the Word that made flesh. But look here in Luke 1. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So yes, Sam Gibb is definitely wrong about uh, Jesus, is not, Jesus not being his actual name. Um, we don't call him Emmanuel, we call him Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Right Now that looks very familiar to the Son of God, doesn't it? The Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I haven't slept with a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So this is the reason why I sort of think every time we see the Son being referred to, it's sort of referring to the, the man, Christ Jesus, and the Word is the person that's within the Trinity, right? And it was the Word that became flesh, and, and there's all that blending that I won't go into that I went into in my last sermon that got me into all this trouble. Now, John 8, 17. It says here, It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. So you see, like, if somebody doesn't recognize that there's a distinction between the humanity and the deity, they just think, ah, see, two people here. Two people within the Godhead, the Son and the Father. But again, this can be the two persons of the man and God, right? It can be the man, Jesus, testifying, and then the Father in heaven, you know, God in heaven, testifying as well, the two men. And, and this is why I kind of don't mind this whole person thing, right? Because it's these two testimonies. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Now, I do think it's important that there is a distinction, right? That there must be a distinction in identity in different persons, because John 5 says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true, right? So if, if, you, if you can't explain it by the distinction between man and God, and there is no distinction there, then that is a big deal, right? Because Jesus is saying here that if I bear witness of myself, if, only, if there is only one person, right, and not two persons somehow, then that's a problem, right? Because God is saying you need the testimony of two men. If he bears witness of himself, his witness is not true. He says there is another that beareth witness of me. But they don't have that problem, right? Because the, 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 the problem is solved by humanity and deity, two people, right? The man and God. Now, I've put this one here because I do think this one is actually a weak argument. And I'll explain why, right? Because this is one where people go to 1 John 5, 7 and say there's three witnesses, therefore three persons. Now, I did say in the last one, at the testimony of two men, I think this one's important because it actually says two men is true, right? Um, but it's not only men that bear witness. This is why, it's, this is why I, I think, I mean, I, this, is one, this is one argument that I threw at the four men, right? To say, explain this one to me. Right? And here's the explanation. That's why I've included verse 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So generally you hear that. Three witnesses must be three separate. The problem is, it says here, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So you see how it's not enough proof to just say if there's a witness, then it is a person, because there are things in the second verse, in verse 8, that are things that are bearing witness. The blood bears witness, right? But that's not a person, is it? You know, the spirit, and I, I don't think this is talking about necessarily the Holy Spirit in the second verse, but the spirit bears witness. I'm thinking, I, I'm not 100% sure it, what it is, but I, I think there's a distinction between what's being said in verse 7 and verse 8. So I don't think the Holy Ghost would be included in verse 8. I think it's referring maybe to the spirit of Jesus as a man somehow. Um, so I think, I think these things in the second verse have something to do with Jesus being a man, like the fact that there's blood, his spirit, um, you know, and the water birth. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. But my point being is, is if somebody has the argument of, oh, it must be a person because it's a witness, they have trouble explaining verse 8 because you have three things bearing witness. Like how is, a, how is water a person? You know, I don't know what the spirit is, right? But how is blood a person? But it's saying here that they bear witness. Does that make sense? So if somebody's going to say a witness is always persons, they would have to be consistent and say, well, is blood a person? Is water a person? 
You know, these things bear witness, but they're not people. They're not person, persons. So that's why I think it's a, it's a weak argument. But here are the stronger arguments. I uh, end on the strong. These are the ones uh, I think are stronger because uh, the, ones that the, the ones that I talked to about this, they didn't have answers for these. Right? And this is why I'm comfortable in my position right now because my position can answer these you know, because it accepts three persons and one person, but the position of one person, three components cannot answer these. Here's some stronger arguments. Um, John 17, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, and now, O Father, glorify, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Right? So this is a passage where we see Jesus saying, I had glory with you, the Father, before the world was. So this, cannot, this is a passage that cannot be explained by Jesus being a man. right? Because he's saying, before he became a man, before he was manifest in the flesh, right? he already had glory with the Father. Now, how can you say you're with somebody when it's you? Right? So then there must be some sort of distinction there. I can't say I'm with, I'm not, I don't say I'm with myself. Right? Now I kind of do get you know, how that can be because obviously there's not two gods. Right? So like I said in my videos, like I kind of accept both. So I'm not saying God being with himself is necessarily wrong. But if, there's, if I only accept one of the walls, right? because remember the two walls are one person and three person. Right? Um, if I only accept one of the walls, which is one person, I can say God is with himself, but then you, you can't say that you're with somebody when there's only you. That's why there must be that other wall that can explain why somebody can be with somebody. It's like in John 1.1, 1, 1, you, you, if you were to just say God is only one person, how is the word with God when the word was God? How is he with God if there's only one? Right? That's why there's the Trinity. There's the three persons in one person because it, it's, it's kind of like 1 John 5, 7 is that verse that's the glue that explains to us that there is these contradictory things in our mind when we describe the nature of God, but it brings them both together because God is obviously outside our limitations. Um, and Genesis 1, here's another one. So this one is... John 17 saying that Jesus had glory with the Father before he was even a man, you know, before he became flesh. Another argument that, you know, that there was pretty much no answer to was God said, let us make man in our image after our, uh, us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every creeping thing that creepeth. So the argument is, if there's only one person and not three persons, how can, you, how can you say our, right? Our, our means that there are more than one person there, right? How can you say our image, us? These are not words that describe an individual. These are words that describe a group of individuals, right? But it's not polytheism because of the concept of the Trinity, the fact that God is these two sort of contradictory states in our mind, right? But because God can be anything, right? God is not limited by what we can be, right? He can be both. So, again, no answer to that one. Uh, John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So Jesus wants to say more things to the disciples, right? Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Right? So Jesus is saying that, I mean, he, he's almost saying here, I'm speaking the Father's words, right? Because he's saying the mine are actually the Father's. But I'm just saying everything the Father has is mine. That's why I can say he's going to take of mine. Right? But then he says, but he says that the Holy Ghost shall not speak of himself. So he's making the point that these are not the words of the Holy Ghost. He's taking Jesus' words, and Jesus' words are the Father's words, right? And that's why he says, I can take of mine. But they're not the Holy Ghost's words. Right? He's not speaking his own words. He's speaking somebody else's words. Now, if I only accept 
one wall, one person of the Holy Ghost is speaking of himself, right? Because they're his words. But I need to accept the other wall to understand that they, they, why they cannot be his words even though the three are one, right? So the answer I got was pretty much, well, because the three components, and I explained this in the video, right? Because the three components are living or alive, even though I don't want to call them persons, they have separate identities. And I'm just like, okay, is this just semantics now? <laughs> like, like if, you, if you're saying that everything that I believe about the three, per, like the three persons you ascribe to the three components or elements, I don't know what the difference is now besides the actual word, right? So that's why I'm just like, I don't even know, is this semantics? Like they just don't, but the reason why they don't like that word is because they have their own definition of person, which is not a definition that's actually when I look it up in Google. So I'm not sure where they're getting that, that definition from. Now, the, the counter argument was basically like, well, it's you're accepting a contradiction, right? And, and I think uh, the, the example that was given to me was, it's almost like you have these verses that, <clears throat> um, I'm just gonna, sorry, just let me a drink because my voice is fully like dying right now. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the, the explanation basically that was given to me was, um, well, it's kind of like you have verses that you know, kind of teach salvation by works, which I think there are explanation to, right? But, you know, just for argument's sake, right? That there are verses that um, say salvation is by works, which there isn't, but let's say there is. And then there are verses that say salvation is by grace. And, and, and the argument was basically, well, because you don't have an explanation for these, you're just accepting both and just saying, oh, both are true. Both are, even though they contradict, both are true. Now, the reason why I think that doesn't hold is because number one, the Bible does say salvation is not by grace, ah, not by works, by grace, right? Um, and the Bible does say that you can't mix grace and works. You know, if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So even scripturally, can't hold. I can't, I like, even if I try and say, well, I don't have an explanation for both, so I'm just gonna accept both positions. Uh, one is I can't even make that line up with scripture because scripture's already telling me I can't accept both, right? Because there's one or the other. And the other thing is it's impossible for a man to do both, right? Either you're saved by grace or you're saved by works. You cannot, you cannot physically do both. Now, the reason why it's not a contradiction with God it's because God, like I said, he's not limited, like he's not a man, right? So he can be contradictory things when we are trying to understand the nature of God. And not only that, we have, ver we have a verse in the Bible that allows us to accept this contradiction, right? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So I have scriptural authority to accept that. I mean, the fact that, I, I, I like a comment that somebody put on YouTube that I read, and it basically said, you've, when you've accepted three equals one, it's kind of like, we're already past understanding, right? It's kind of like, he, he wrote like three equals one. It's like, we're already at the point where we're, we're striving to understand something that is beyond us, right? So is it a contradiction? Well, yeah, it is to us, but is it a contradiction to, to God? No, because I already, in my previous sermon, sort of talked about how, you know, God can be two things that are illogical, right? Like he's man and God. Uh, what other ones did I have? Um, I want to share this with you. know, Luke 18, 27, he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So more verses showing that you, you can't have something that man can't do and say, well, therefore it's illogical with God because, you know, with God, these things are possible, especially when we're, like I said, we're trying to ex understand the nature of God. We're trying to understand a being that is outside of his creation. We have absolutely no idea what it's like to live outside of his creation. We can't even comprehend the, uh, another dimension, right? And I, love, I loved a, an explanation I heard a long time ago where this guy, he sort of had this, this, uh, this picture on the, uh, an illustration. And he said, just imagine, right, uh, just imagine that there was this 2D world, right? And, and he, he said he had these two people, like Mr. A, Mr. B, whatever, and they live in a 2D world. 
and we see them as a face on the page. But when they look at each other, I wish I'd made an image for this, I didn't think I was talking about this. If they look at each other, right, what would they see in a 2D world? They would just see a line, wouldn't they? Because they would just see the, the, they would be looking at, Mr. A would be looking at Mr. B on this sheet of paper, and they would just see a line. But we, from the third dimension, see the shape that way, right? So, they, even if he walked around this man, all he sees is this line, right? If you can imagine on a piece of paper, like if you're looking at a 2D person, and even if you were to, he was to circle him, because he can't circle him this way, that's three-dimensional, right? He's circling him this way, he can only see this line. So he only knows Mr. B as this line. But we see Mr. B as this smiley face, right? This guy, and he's got eyes and a mouth and whatnot. I'm trying to help you imagine this, these two circles that have faces, right? And they can, they can turn and talk to each other, but they, all they can see is a line. So he says, for you to try and explain to these two people on the page what the third dimension is like, they, they just cannot comprehend it. They just have no idea what a third dimension is because all they know is two dimensions. Every one to them is this one line, right? But you're trying to explain to them, no, this person actually has a face, has a mouth. But they can't see that, right, in a two-dimensional world. So the way he sort of, and I just remember this because it was just like a revolution for me when he said like, um, you know, this is maybe one way we can understand the Trinity. It may, he said, you as a 3D person, Let's say you stuck your one finger into that piece of paper, right? And Mr. A and Mr. B are kind of like, whoa, what's that, right, finger in the paper? What would they see? They would see a line, one line, right? But then that's Victor, right, in this example. There's, and they say, oh, I know Victor. He's one line, right, because he revealed himself, one line. And let's say you take your finger out, and now you put three fingers into the paper. What are they going to see now? Three lines. So it's like, well, is Victor one line or is he three lines? But maybe he's both. So it's kind of like this idea that that's, that's what I'm saying, like this nature of God, it's like outside our dimension. So we can't limit him by what we understand within this dimension when, we were, when we're talking about the nature of God, right? When we're talking about these things. So I just thought it was a really cool example that kind of made me think, oh yeah, like, you know, like you know, how, how can you limit God to, to what he is when we talk about his nature? So... Um, and another thing is, it, it, it's funny, so that, was one, that was, so that was one of the objections. It was kind of like, well, or they, they understood. Uh, one of the objections was you can't accept both. But I think you can accept both. Because, you know, God is already, you know, he is, was, is to come, root and offspring, son of David, lord of David, man, God. Um, you know, he's, he's, um, he's omnipresent, but he's not. And he's omnipotent, yet he isn't at the same time within man. And uh, he's omniscient, yet not at the same time, right? This is this whole mystery of godliness that we talked about. The other thing as well is, and um, you know, it's funny because I, I haven't actually responded to this guy I'm talking about, so I'm just going to send him this sermon. But uh, one thing I think like they kind of, they might not realize yet is when, when they think they can't accept three persons and one person at the same time, I kind of feel like you're, you're, you're kind of already doing it, but you might not be realizing that you're accepting two persons and one at the same time already. Why? Because they acknowledge that there's a distinction between man and God, right? And they acknowledge that God is a man as a person and the Godhead is another person. But yet they don't believe in two gods, right? They believe there's one God. So there already is, that's why I'm just drawing this, I'm just taking these pictures from my last sermon, but this is the Godhead, right? And that's the man Christ Jesus. So we have, in their view, one person, which is the Godhead, the express image of his person, who can contend his person. That's their view, right? Talking about the Godhead. But they distinguish between the man and the Godhead when I went through all those verses, right? Handing up the kingdom, not my will but thine, all that sort of thing. Because there are two persons, there are two people there. Testimony of two men, right? Because that's one man that's testifying and that's the second person that's testifying. But they don't believe that there are two gods, that there is one God, one person, who is both man and God. So you see how they already sort of accept two persons. So... If I say that there are person one, person two, person three, and they are one person, why is that so crazy? Do you know what I mean? Like I've already accepted two persons are one in the fact that there is man and God. Now I'm just accepting within the Godhead there's three persons that are one. To me, that's not a contradiction. To me, that lines up with scripture. You know, it has no, has no problem lining up with scripture, has no problem with the, 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 the nature of God. Uh, we even have a verse that says, 
you know, uh, well, that wasn't the next verse, I thought it was, that's why I did that. But <laughs> we even have a verse that says, you know, there are three that bear record in heaven and these three are one. Um, so, you know, it, it all lines up. So is it, is it semantics? I don't know, like, you know, because everything, everything that, everything, when, when I talk to somebody about the Trinity, right, and they talk about this substance, every, every attribute about that substance sort of lines up with what I would consider as a person. One identity, his, I, you know, there, there are not three gods, there's only one God. And then I talk to these guys and everything that they believe about the three components is three persons. And I'm just like, I don't get it. Are we all sitting, are we all actually sitting here? Do you know what I mean? It's just semantics because, you know, this one substance pretty much is this one person and these three persons are these three components. I'm confused now. I, I mean, I don't get it. I don't know why there's such a big issue. Like, that's how I kind of see it, right? It's there, there are three, you know, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I think this whole argument is just over semantics. The attributes we all agree with, and, you know, maybe we sit somewhere different along this line with our definitions, but we're all sitting within these common walls, which are, there are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one. So anyways, I hope that gives you a bit more understanding. I'm just giving you some extra information on what I put in that video about this whole issue. And uh, next week, we'll move on to a, another new, exciting, controversial topic. All right, all right, let's, uh, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. Thank you, um, Lord, give us understanding, give us uh, wisdom. We don't know everything, Lord. We need you to tell us and reveal to us through your Holy Spirit. Uh, help us, Lord, to just have faith in your word and just believe what we read, uh, even if it's not comfortable for us. And uh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. And uh, we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing uh, one more song. Let's sing uh, Holy, Holy, Holy. Um, holy, holy, holy. Here we go. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Sorry. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, Blessed Trinity, holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. Cherubim and seraphim, Falling down before thee, who wast and art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity.